with the Israel-Hamas war. The combined death toll at the moment has topped 1,200, and that number is expected to rise. The war began early on Saturday morning. In an unprecedented surprise attack, Hamas militants stormed the blockaded Gaza Strip, entering about 20 different Israeli towns and communities. The chaos stretched across land, air and sea as thousands of rockets were fired into Israel. Militants were seen bulldozing through barricades between Gaza and Israel. One of the first targets was a music festival held in the desert just three miles from the border. More than 200 bodies have been recovered from that event alone. Other towns were then engulfed in smoke, flames and gunfire as militants went door to door attacking civilians. Officials say this was the deadliest assault Israel has seen in decades, and it came nearly 50 years to the day since Israel was caught off guard by invading forces from Egypt and Syria. On Saturday night, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu officially declared war, saying Israel's military will use all of its strength to destroy Hamas's capabilities. This morning, Israeli officials announced they have regained control of communities along the Gaza border, but... Officials stress the situation is fluid as clashes with the militants are ongoing. As of now, at least 700 people have been killed in Israel and about 2,100 are wounded, according to the Israeli Defense Forces. Palestinian authorities, meanwhile, say more than 400 people have been killed there in the counterattack and more than 2,000 have been injured. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer confirmed last night that at least four Americans are among the dead adding that that toll is expected to rise. Israel also believes that some Americans are being held hostage. A senior Hamas official says the militant group is holding more than 100 people captive in Gaza. Among them are women, children, soldiers and other civilians. Joining us now from the Gaza border, NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. All day, Israelis have been looking at images of people who have been killed and of people who are being held hostage very close to where you are inside Gaza. What's the latest situation there? So uh, we are just outside the, the, uh, the town of Zdirot. Uh, it is an Israeli community here, not far from the Gaza border. And uh, there is an active fighting going on right now. Uh, you, if we listen here, you might be able to hear some explosions in the background. Uh, Hamas militants are firing right now rockets from Gaza at Zdirot. Uh, we've seen some of them uh, impact in the sky above us just a, just a few moments ago as the Israeli Iron Dome uh, system is, is knocking them down. Uh, some of the, the rockets have, however, landed in Zderot, Ashkelon and Ashdod, and we are uh, told that there are casualties. So uh, the, the Israelis are, are bombing Gaza. As you said earlier, there are hundreds of Palestinians killed so far. That number, according to Palestinian health officials, uh, is now around 500 uh, in, in these reprisal uh, operations uh, since the, the, the Saturday uh, assault, uh, which was unprecedented here. Uh, we've seen rockets many times fired from Gaza. But we haven't seen hundreds of Hamas militants escaping from the Gaza Strip and going on a killing rampage inside Israel, uh, a killing rampage that for now, Israel says, has more or less stopped. It believes uh, that uh, there are no uh, active gunfights uh, going on right now. So there are no uh, places where Hamas is still in control. And that wasn't the case just yesterday. Uh, but uh, the, the Israelis do not know if there are other Hamas militants still on the loose. They just say that this mop-up operation here in southern Israel is nearing a conclusion that there are no active gunfights right now, but they are still hunting for, for potential Hamas militants. Uh, there, are, there is, of course, that ongoing hostage situation. That is a major complicating factor here, because uh, in the past, when there have been conflicts between uh, Israel, Israel and Hamas, Israel moves in quickly, uh, launches devastating attacks against uh, against Hamas infrastructure in Gaza, but it is finding that very difficult this time because there are dozens of, of hostages, perhaps 100, perhaps more, uh, inside Gaza, uh, and, and Israeli officials expect that they are being used as human shields. As, as you mentioned, Israel is mobilizing for war. Uh, the, the army said just a, a short while ago that it has called up 300,000 reservists. Uh, it, it could be it is trying to uh, secure the country, or it could be that it is preparing for another phase 
of this uh, of this uh, conflict, potentially a ground assault into the Gaza Strip, which uh, would be very risky for the hostages, very costly for the Palestinians, and likely very costly for the Israelis as well. So, Richard, as you were speaking, we were seeing some images of those young music festival goers fleeing uh, for their safety. We know that more than 200 killed there. Um, just horrifying images. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the complications by presented by the hostages being held there by Hamas. Uh, we know from Senate Majority Leader Schumer that at least four Americans have died. Do you have a sense there from the ground? Are there any Americans currently being held hostage? Uh, the the breakup or the makeup of the of the hostages is uh, for now a, a closely held secret. Uh, the the number of the hostages, who they are, uh, is, has not been released. Uh, the Israeli media are talking about a hundred, but really they're they're they're, they're keeping it more ge uh, generic, talking about dozens. Uh, but it would not be surprising. Israel and the United States are, are very close. There are many dual nationals uh, here. Uh, I've been speaking to dual nationals this morning who lived in in Zderot. Uh, so uh, it's very possible, but I, I don't have that uh, confirmed right now. All right. Well, we greatly appreciate your reporting. Stay safe there. We'll be checking with you later during the day. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel, thank you again. And joining us now, international spokesperson for Israel's Defense Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Heck. Lieutenant Colonel, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Please uh, give us the latest, if you will, uh, in the ongoing mission there uh, in southern Israel. So, Richard, your reporter on the, on the ground actually did uh, told the story probably much better than I. It means that we're doing probably a good job in trying to say or talk about the level of this event, which is an epic event. Uh, as mentioned, and he did it very well, more or less on spot, we are now stabilizing the communities. There's still small pockets. Uh, we've managed to gain control. It took us longer than we thought back in the communities around the Gaza Strip. Um, the, the 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 gore and the carnage and the the inhumane activity in Hamas in these settlements is starting to unfold because we're now speaking to the families, understand that they went through tragic tragic events, tragic tragic events. Um, but we were managing to stabilize that. We are now focusing on organizing the area. We have deployed. Uh, four divisions down to Gaza, and we're trying to organize the area so to stabilize uh, the Gaza Strip and their communities. Where by the end of the day, we should be able to evacuate most of our communities and whoever is left uh, away from uh, the Gaza so they can recuperate uh, nearer to the center of the country. And, and sir, the Israeli defense minister. A uh, short time ago, ordered what he deemed a complete siege on Gaza, saying authorities would cut electricity and block the entry of food uh, and fuel uh, to that area. Tell us what exactly that means, and, and how long could something like that be put in place? What's the end game? So the end game uh, at this stage, from the military perspective, I don't want to. I'm not a spokesperson for our Minister of Defense, but from the military perspective, we are now acting to secure the border. There's still areas where we're, we haven't fixed the border completely, where they breached, and we are uh, securing the border, and we're also severely targeting Hamas targets inside the Gaza Strip. Uh, again, before we run to uh, uh, to the to the Gazans, we, I think we have to give place to what actually happened here within the Israeli public. Uh, they started this. Um, you know, one of the the, the tragic events on, on when I, when I look at them is that they targeted the areas crossing so what up a week ago it was an, it was it was getting there were more people coming into israel for medical treatment to work and they one of one of their main entry points with their iso pickup trucks was through the areas crossing so before we start talking about the palestinians let's talk about what happened in israel and it was a dramatic horrific inhumane activity colonel are you surprised by that activity, are you surprised by the way that Hamas managed to uh, mount this operation, carry it out, get through that fence, get within 15 kilometers of Israeli territory, even attack an Israeli military base? Are you surprised that they were able to do that without Israel being aware of what was about to happen? 
So these are big questions that I'm sure they'll be talked about. I'm sure there'll be books written about what happened here uh, with this surprise attack, which was said, we said it out loud, it was a surprise attack. Uh, combined offensive, this will be talked about a lot. Right now, I think our directive is to talk about what's actually happening on the ground, is getting back our safety and severely degrading Hamas capability in the Gaza Strip. Sadly, they've taken... They're using people as human shields, and all their headquarters are uh, entrenched in civilian community. There are attacks from last night in Sajai and Bet Hanun are where the launching pads for hundreds of terrorists that came into Israel. So, Colonel, you spoke there about the human shields, and I'm, I assume you're referring to the Palestinian human shields that are frequently used in Gaza uh, and, and put amongst military installations. But this operation is more complicated than any the IDF has ever faced before because there are now also Israeli captives, dozens of them, we are being told, inside Gaza. What are your options, given that there are Israeli hostages inside Gaza at the moment? So we're the People's Army. Um, again, I'm bringing in a personal perspective here, and this is something that is very important for the people that are watching this to understand. Every soldier that I have out here, even myself, a child that grew up in my house, one of the best friends from my daughter uh, died. We, they just found his, just before we came on, we got told that he fa they found his body in the division headquarters. Uh, this, everybody, this has touched everybody here. So the hostage situation is handled very, very sensitively. The IDF has taken control of this. First of all, engaging with the families. A lot of families still don't know what's happening. We're slowly, it's slowly unfolding while we understand the picture. Uh, it'll take us some more time. And yes, uh, it's going to be a very, very challenging military operation. I'm sure there's diplomatic channels going on. They're not in my sphere of responsibility. But right now the IDF is planning to severely degrade Hamas capabilities, I repeat. International spokesperson for Israel's Defense Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht, thank you for coming on this morning and our condolences thank you for having on me that on. loss you just said. And we will get... Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville, however, of Alabama, well, he's standing firm on his months-long blockade on hundreds of military promotions, despite that deadly conflict in Israel. Tuberville's blockade has put a hold on at least 300 military nominees, including top officers who would command forces in the Middle East, including Rear Admiral George Wyckoff, who is slated to lead the Fifth Fleet that includes naval forces operating in the Middle East at the moment. The current Fifth Fleet commander, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, is supposed to be promoted to deputy commander of U.S. CENTCOM, which oversees troops and military operations in the Middle East region. But that promotion is also being held up by Tuberville. In a statement, Tuberville's office reaffirmed his stance and suggested Democrats could call each of the hundreds of nominations for individual votes. That process would take hundreds of hours, however. The Republican senator has maintained the promotions blockade to, the pro to, prote to protest the Defense Department's policy that gives time off and reimbursements for service members and their family members seeking abortions out of state. It does seem like an extraordinary time for America not to have the people in place that it needs in CENTCOM and in the Fifth Fleet, just as that Fifth Fleet alley is moving closer to the region. Is there anyone there on Capitol Hill, presumably on the Senate side, I'm not sure where that leadership would come from, but who could put pressure on Senator Tuberville to say, listen, you know, OK, we get the stance, but right now U.S. forces are in a position where they could materially aid our key ally in the region, Israel, and we need those promotions in post. Of course, the landscape has changed over the course of the last two to three days, Caddy, but that pressure has already been on the senator from Alabama. And it does feel like at each turn, when there is an opportunity for an exit ramp, he does not take it and continues to hold his ground here. We did see the confirmation of three key postings. That was something that Senator Chuck Schumer did a few weeks ago. But as you mentioned, it would take hours to go through each of these positions one by one and confirm them. The national security concerns here are not new. From the moment that Tuberville began this blockade and these promotions started piling up, experts and national security officials were clear. This is endangering U.S. national security. That has not changed Tuberville's mind. 
It's going to be interesting to see whether or not Israel now being a factor implicates or changes anything in the mind of the senator. But I do think it's important to note we're not going to see senators back this week. They are out of town on recess, some of them on Codell's across the country. Uh, I'm sorry, ac across the world. That's going to be something that keeps them far from Washington. They're still getting briefed. But in terms of us being able to press Senator Tuberville, that's not something that we're going to see. And I think there's also the open question of now that Israel is part of the landscape, how does this impact the conversation around Ukraine aid, especially as some Republican senators have been reticent to give there, but are calling for aid to Israel now? Yeah, we'll dive into that. Put a little complication in a little while. NBC News yeah. Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali, thank you. Busy few days ahead for you. We yeah. appreciate it. Joining us now, State Department spokesman Matt Miller. Matt, thanks for joining us this morning. And let's start right away. What is the latest that we know about the number of Americans who may have been killed in Israel? Uh, we can confirm that there are nine American citizens who have lost their lives uh, as a result of these horrific attacks. Uh, we obviously extend our condolences, our thoughts are with the victims and their families. We have been offering consular assistance to, uh, to the families of those uh, lost Americans and consulting closely with the uh, government of Israel and will continue to do so. And Matt, beyond those nine and a deeply tragic number, are there reports of other Americans who are missing? or perhaps being held hostage. There are reports of Americans who are unaccounted for. Uh, we continue to work to confirm that number and to, to try to locate those who are missing. Uh, we don't have, have solid information about either the number or where they might be. Uh, we'll continue to work through that with the government of Israel as they continue to take back uh, towns in, in southern Israel that were attacked by Gaza. Or, I'm sorry, that were attacked by Hamas. And, 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 and Matt, we heard from the president over the weekend uh, offering support to Israel in the strongest of terms. Can you give us an update as to what exactly that means in terms of financial, <clears throat> military, or security assistance? Sure. In the immediate aftermath of these attacks, the president ordered his national security team to get in, to, to remain in close touch with their Israeli counterparts and to ensure that they have everything that they need to respond to this terrorist attack uh, in the most, most forth, forceful way possible. The Secretary of State has been in close contact with his uh, counterparts in the government of Israel. The Secretary of Defense has been in close contact with his counterparts. And you've seen the first military shipments start to move yesterday. Those will arrive in the region, uh, will arrive in Israel in the coming days. That includes munitions. In addition, the secretary has been uh, in touch with foreign counterparts in the region to ensure that everyone makes clear that this horrific terrorist attack was unacceptable and that uh, everyone who has any influence needs to ensure that the uh, 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 that uh, that Hamas releases all any and all hostages immediately uh, and, and take steps to ensure that the conflict does not widen in terms of Hezbollah or other groups, other enemies or potential enemies of Israel seeking to take advantage of this uh, conflict. And that we played earlier in the show, the Secretary of State was on Meet the Press yesterday and mused that a possible motivation for these attacks over the weekend for this bloodshed was to prevent this normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia that's been in the works for a while now, you know, certainly not complete just yet. We've heard cautious optimism from both sides in recent weeks. Now, of course, now dealing with the after effects, the aftermath of this violence. Could you expand a little bit upon what he meant, what signs you guys are picking up on that, that suggests that was indeed a motivation for what happened? Well, I won't speak to what the motivations of, of Hamas might have been. Obviously, they have conducted terrorist attacks against Israel for years. It's why the United States has held Hamas accountable. It's why the United States has held uh, Hamas's financial backers, including Iran, accountable for the, the attacks that they have launched. Um, but it has been clear that Hamas is opposed to normalization between Israel, uh, normalization of relations between Israel and countries in the region. It is clear that Iran uh, is opposed to normalization between Israel and others in the region. And as the secretary made clear, uh, in his appearance on, on Meet the Press yesterday, uh, there are really two paths for the region to take. One is a path of increased stability, of increased relationships between Israel and its neighbors, and the other is a, a, the, the path of conflict, of terrorism, of death and destruction. That is the path that Hamas and other terrorist organizations offer, and it is one that we are deeply opposed to and that we are, de that we are, are trying to prevent, and it's why we will continue to work to, to advance relationships between Israel and its partners in the region. 
And joining us now from north of the Gaza border is NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez. Raf, uh, tell us more as to where you are and what you are seeing. Jonathan, good morning. We are in the city of Ashkelon. We're about 10 miles north of the Gaza border. And this is the latest city to be hit by what is feeling like an unending stream of rocket fire from Gaza. Rockets came down here a little over an hour ago. You can see the car behind me here is just riddled with shrapnel. And I just want to walk our viewers through the scene for a second. If Dave Copeland, my camera operator, will just point the camera down here. This is the actual impact site. This is where the rocket it went into the asphalt. But what is miraculous here, guys, is that this fuel tanker behind me did not explode because you can only imagine the scale of the destruction. You can see the windshield of this truck is shattered, but the actual fuel tank itself is intact. And it is underscoring one of the many, many, many questions Israelis are asking themselves this morning, which is what is happening with its famed Iron Dome missile defense system, an air defense system that was developed in partnership with the United States that has been so successful in years past, but is struggling under the sheer volume of rocket fire. Jonathan, a couple of important developments over the course of this morning. Number one, the Israeli military says they are once again, for the first time in the 48 hours since the surprise attack began. They are in control of the Israeli towns and settlements along the Gaza border because for an almost unbelievably long period of time, Hamas militants were holding buildings, they were holding streets. In some cases, they were holding whole neighborhoods of Israeli communities. The Israeli IDF, Israel Defense Forces, says they are back in control. There is still sporadic fighting going on with individual gunmen. The other major, major developments, the Israel's, Israel's defense minister says he has imposed a state of siege on the Gaza Strip. He says no food, no fuel, and no electricity is getting in. And as Caddy mentioned earlier, Gaza is home to two million civilians who live under Hamas rule, but have no say in Hamas's actions, no say in this terrible attack that has unfolded over the weekend. And it is these people who will be paying the price alongside these Hamas commanders, these Hamas leaders. Uh, the death toll inside Israel is now at more than 700, according to the Israeli government. It is at more than 400 inside of Gaza, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, as a result of these Israeli airstrikes. Israel's military says that it is, it does everything it can to minimize civilian casualties, to target only Hamas infrastructure, but civilians are caught up. And Jonathan, I'll just close with this. Everything we are seeing on the ground indicates that Israel is preparing for an imminent ground offensive. We have seen column after column of Israeli tanks moving towards the Gaza border. Israel has called up 300,000 reservists, which is a number so vast that you only go to that level if you were planning a major operation, given the toll that takes on the Israeli economy. So while the death toll inside Gaza is large now, if Israeli forces go in in large numbers, we expect that toll to rise much, much higher. Guys. So, Raf, what does that look like, though? Because if they go in and there are, as Hamas is saying, something like 100, and we haven't got that number confirmed, but the, the speculation is dozens, anyway, of Israeli and, frankly, international. There are Germans say they have hostages. The Americans have hostages, potentially, as well. How do they go in? They've called up 300,000 reservists. How do you go in with a massive ground invasion whilst protecting the lives of those hostages? Caddy, you have just underscored the agonizing decisions facing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel's political and security leadership. This is, on the one hand, a massive military operation designed to smash Hamas's infrastructure to inflict a massive price for the surprise attack over the weekend. And on the other hand, it is possibly the most complex hostage rescue operation maybe the world has ever seen. As you know, Hamas has effectively an underground city of tunnels in Gaza, and you can bet 
that these hostages are underground, they have been spread out. Hamas will do everything it can to make it as difficult as possible for Israel to rescue these people, given that these hostages are seen as nearly invaluable bargaining chips from Hamas's perspective. You'll remember back in 2011, Israel freed a thousand Palestinian prisoners to get back one soldier, Gilad Shalit. If there are dozens, if there's more than a hundred, Israeli soldiers and civilians inside Gaza, you can imagine what Hamas feels it has in terms of poker chips in a future negotiation. I should say, Hamas says already this morning that four Israeli hostages are dead as a result of Israeli airstrikes inside the Gaza Strip. That, of course, is not something that NBC News can confirm independently, but it underscores the scale of the issue here. I'll just close with this. We've just come from interviewing a father. His name is Yoni. His wife and his two daughters, age three and five, are inside Gaza, as far as he knows. They were taken from their grandmother's house in the early hours of Saturday morning. He only learned what happened to them through a Hamas video where he saw his wife being blindfolded, one arm protectively over the shoulders of her daughter. You may be able to hear the booms from the airstrikes above us. He says he will do anything, literally anything, to get his family back. And that if Hamas was prepared to accept some kind of agreement where he goes into Gaza and offers himself as a prisoner to free his family, he would do it. And that is the sentiment being shared by hundreds and hundreds of families all across Israel right now. Guys. Wow. Oof. Raf Sanchez, thank you very much. NBC News foreign correspondent, what an awful dilemma for those families and those videos, of course, being played all around Israel at the moment. To jump into that package because Richard Engel is live with us now. And Richard, you're you're there near the border. What's happening? All right, Nico. Well, I can tell you right now, we are in the town of Zderot, and there has been a lot of incoming fire here. It believe we believe that it is mortar fire. Some of them also appear to have been rockets. They've been coming in quite close. That is why we are on the, the ground right now. This is still considered a very active combat zone, even though we are inside Israeli territory. And it is not just the incoming rockets and mortars. Uh, there are also reports from Israeli officials of new infiltrations, of Hamas sending more fighters through breaches in the border fence. According to uh, a senior Israeli official, there are about 30 different holes, breaches in that border uh, perimeter. And most of them have been plugged up, around 90% of them have been plugged up, but 10% remain, they're trying to secure them, but remain open. So uh, this is still an active situation here. Uh, most of the residents uh, in this area have been cleared out, uh, and the Israelis are trying to move people away from, from, uh, from border towns and communities and, and to try and also look for Hamas fighters because they believe that, that cells, sleeper cells, or, or other fighters uh, have, have infiltrated and are still in the area, potentially hiding in some of the buildings. And now maybe it seems like that big barrage uh, that, that, uh, that we just uh, experienced has has passed. They they come in waves, but this one was uh, right, uh, practically right on top of us, uh, right here in in Zderot. Richard, if any moment you and your crew need to move to get to safety, please do so. Uh, if you can speak to us and continue to speak to us, uh, it, just to be clear, the mortar fire that you're hearing, it's not just then Israelis attacking Gaza. There are still rockets coming out of Gaza into Israel. Is that right? Oh, 100 um, percent. There are rockets coming out of Gaza and mortars. We are very close to the, uh, the Gaza Strip. In fact, the, the warning time, and you don't always get a warning. Uh, Israel has uh, sophisticated air defense and air warning systems. Uh, from Gaza to here is only about 20 seconds. And sometimes, particularly with the, the smaller munitions like the mortars, you don't get uh, a warning. Uh, we didn't hear a, a warning f uh, for very long before the, 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 this latest barrage uh, happened. So to answer your question, yes, there are still rockets and mortars coming out of Gaza. The Israelis are bombing inside Gaza. Uh, we've seen uh, and, and heard Israeli jets and drones flying overhead. And the infiltrations are still, are, are still underway. 
in the past hour, there were reports from the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, that they had managed to secure that border area. It looks from what you're saying that that's not the case. We also heard that 300,000 reservists have been called up. Are you seeing, Richard, any signs yet where you are of those reservists preparing to mount any kind of land invasion into Gaza? Well, uh, it is difficult to know uh, what they are preparing to do, but we have seen a buildup of forces here. We've seen uh, tanks, we've seen armored personnel carriers, we've seen medical vehicles, we've seen a whole host of different armored vehicles moving into this area with uh, a full complement of soldiers. It's hard to know if they're preparing for some sort of assault. I don't think the number of troops that we've seen indicates that they're getting ready for any kind of land incursion. And a land incursion at this stage would be enormously difficult because there are still so many Israeli hostages inside. So these seem to be mortars. They are coming in very close. Keep your seconds are in the vehicle and off. Yeah. One. Keep rolling. We're going to wait for a moment here. Nico. Guys, do you guys hear me? Richard and the team are safe. I underscore they are safe. He was able to join us on air a few moments after this occurred. We will keep checking in with him and the crew. Joining us now live from Tel Aviv is the former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danan. He is also a member of Israel's Knesset and is on the its Foreign Affairs and Security Committees. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us this morning. If you will, please, just put in perspective what these last few days have been like. Good morning, Jonathan. It has been a horrible two days for us in Israel. We are still counting the, the deaths. We don't know the exact number but it's more than 700. You know, it's very hard to, to imagine that we're talking about two days in a war and already 700 Israelis are dead. And, and uh, the sad part that most of them are not soldiers. Most of them are civilians, teenagers that were taking part in a, in a celebration, in a happening for peace in the South, and they were massacred vigorously by the Hamas barbaric terrorists. Uh, it's beyond imagination, the pictures we have seen in the field. So what we are doing now, we are in pain, we are collecting uh, the bodies, we are telling the families about uh, what happened, uh, but at the same time we are also regrouping our forces, we are calling uh, the troops, and we are getting ready. We are getting ready to, to fight back, uh, and we will fight back, and we will prevail. It will not be easy, but we are committed to hand down the Hamas leadership uh, operatives, and they will pay a heavy price for the barbaric uh, behavior, the barbaric uh, acts unprovoked acts against Israel. So tell us more about what that means, sir. The defense ministry has said that it is now a total siege of Gaza, completely cutting it off uh, from the rest of the world and preparations underway seemingly uh, for a ground assault. Tell us what these next couple of days are going to look like. So uh, we, we are very clear about, about our goals, and we are telling the people of Gaza that we don't want to hurt the civilians. So they will have to move out from the areas where the Hamas is preparing their bunkers, their headquarters. They should move out from those regions because we will get there. We will bomb those areas. We will get to the leadership of the Hamas, and it's not going to look nice. Uh, 
At the same time, we have to realize that dozens of Israelis, including few Americans, were kidnapped brutally uh, from their homes and be, were dragged into Gaza. And I'm talking about children, about families, about elderly persons, even a Holocaust survivor, which at the age of 86 was dragged by the terrorists into Gaza. So th that's another issue that we will have to deal with. But uh, now we are united. We put away all the differences and we are getting ready to, to fight back. Mr. Dunan, the Reuters news agency is reporting that there are some negotiations to have some kind of a hostage for prisoner swap, women and children um, who are being held by Hamas in Gaza in exchange for Palestinian women and children who are being held in Israeli uh, prisons. Can you confirm if those negotiations are taking place? No, I, I cannot confirm that. Uh, we do know that there are a few international players that are trying to, to mediate. But uh, as we speak, we don't know about uh, any concrete uh, efforts. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, now we are not in the, the process of negotiating. We are in the process of, of fighting back. Uh, we have to realize that as we speak, there are still few militants who are inside Israel, not many. So we are now uh, clearing the area, mm -hmm. uh, chasing down those terrorists and preparing ourselves for the next move. And if you go into Gaza and destroy Hamas, um, as the mission has been stated, what then? What does Israel do then? Do you take over Hamas? Do you run Hamas? I know that you're in the middle of a crisis, but I presume as this offensive is being planned, there must be some conversations about what happens afterwards, about the long term, to make Israel's peace more sustainable long term. That is correct. We, we have no intention to rule Gaza or to stay in Gaza. Uh, but unfortunately, when you fight evil, you, you have to fight for your life. You know, when the U.S. fought uh, Al-Qaeda after 9-11, you know, you went all the way. Same with ISIS. And today, you know, just to give you the numbers, you know, 9-11 was a huge tragic for the American people. But compared to our population of 9 million people in Israel, imagine that 40,000 Americans would have been killed in 9-11. That's what happened to us. Almost 1,000 Israelis were massacred in, in one day. So it's a, it's a major issue for us. Uh, so now we don't really think about the day after who will actually run Gaza, who will govern Gaza. I think now we are focusing on eradicating Hamas. That is the goal, and we are determined to achieve it. Former Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Dunan, thank you so much for joining us this morning.